Okay. Uh, kia ora. Um, uh, Craig Stevens, uh, Niwa and the University of Auckland. Um, and so uh, I'm part of a physical oceanography group. Uh, and we look at how the mo uh, ocean moves and mixes. And so I'm um, going to talk about uh, marine footprints to Pai Moana. Um, and so, so this is how sort of the spatial um, distribution of uh, impacts of activity will manifest itself in the domain that we're working in. Um, and a footprint means different things to different people, and it has um, different scales of interest. And so you, you might sort of think it's actually a relatively tangible idea to, uh, to imagine you have some activity in the marine space and it'll have an impact on this particular area. But there's, um, there's microscale sort of structure within it, and it's uh, individual to every particular foot. Um, and it's not consistent everywhere. It also sort of has fuzzy edges, and sometimes it actually has bits that aren't necessarily connected to the, to the middle of the footprint. Um, so, so from a physical perspective, we're trying to, to characterize that in a way that we can ingest into predictive tools. And it's, it's, where, it's, where, it's this prediction point that's, that's key, I think, um, and it's, and it's non-linear, right? It's one thing to think, okay, we're going to have some aquaculture here, and we're going to have a river plume with sediment here, and they're just going to add to each other. You're just going to put an add sign in the middle, and it's not how the world works. It's not how fluids work. They're non-linear. And so these processes interact in a way that's pretty difficult to, to tease out without um, getting into some, some serious mathematics. And so you'll have a whole set of footprints, um, different scales, um, different time scales, different sort of content, and the way you bring them together. And so, uh, C, I should have replaced it with an F for a foot, but that's concentration of impact. And so it'll relate to how um, things are moved around, sort of the gradients and the acceleration, how things are diffused, and then what you're injecting and what you're removing. So you're going to have to get stuck into some serious mathematics to make this stuff happen. Um, but we can do that. Um, there's uh, a long history of development of tools that, will, will, um, that can enable us to look at how these footprints are move and merge. And so this is work from Mark Hadfield, where he's pushing river plumes around um, in tides. And then you'll have weather systems that will change the offshore conditions in our um, uh, focal area. So it is possible. Um, one of the big challenges, though, is the, where the impact is the most is usually right near where it's happening. And so that's actually the small scales. And that's actually very often well within sort of the discretization of a computer model. And so the near field gets very challenging to describe. And so you know, whilst our real footprint might have um, uh, all sorts of structure and, and subtlety within it. In a computer model, you're often having to whack down something that's very simplistic. Uh, and this is right where the action is starting off. So this is where you actually want to get at the rightest, if you can. Um, so the near field is a challenge. Um, the other point, you know, a footprint stays in one spot. Um, the ocean does not. It moves. And so these are some uh, drifter experiments. So this is real data. Um, from surface drifters uh, in the Tasman Golden Bay system moving over a couple of weeks. Uh, and and um, to be clear, these are uh, surface traces, so these are drifting at the surface. Um, but these are some of the first data that are actually giving us a picture of, of how this system moves um, and, and the sort of the take home messages. And we, and we knew this previously, but because it's shallow, um, it's heavily wind influenced. And so, so that's, that's fine at the, the one or two week scale. And so that's when those sort of short term impacts uh, can be gauged. But what happens at the, at the larger scale? And so this, this will last over um, four months. But I've um, taken a leaf out of the participatory um, tools thing. And we're going to um, have a vote. So we've got four. No, hang on. We can't go back. You'll, you'll know the answer. It's going to be four months. And so we're releasing drifters at the mouth of Tasman Golden Bay. And so I want hands up for who thinks they're going to end up in the Tasman Sea. So you have to vote. And if you don't vote, then you have to put up with whatever answer I give you. So who thinks it's going to go? Tell us twice first. Well, I'm, yes, yes, it's happening. Uh, oh, I see what you mean. Hmm. Oh, I'm moving from um, left to right. So Tasman Sea, back into the bays, central Cook Strait, or over into the Western Pacific. So a hands up for Tasman Sea. Hands up for back into the bays. OK. Hands up for hanging around in Central Cook Strait. OK. And then hands up for uh, the Western Pacific. Right. 
<laughs> See what happens. Oh, you know, it'd be anticlimactic if it didn't work. So remember, this is over four months. So you know, this is this is hundreds of kilometres. Well, hundred plus kilometres, and very different. So these are in the top uh, two metres of the water column, um, and so uh, there's a there's a strong um, influence of the wind, uh, and so that's quite a diff difficult thing to predict. But I think we've got a summary plot there at the end. And so so the key point is you can actually when you've only got um, a few. Uh, individual realizations, you can have some quite um, outlying uh, realizations. Um, and so that's surface data. The other aspect of the ocean is that it's stratified and it, different things can happen at different depths. Um, in, we would have had a different set of traces there and you would have had to put your hand up differently if we'd had those drifters drogued at depth. Um, and it's much, much harder to, to run drifter experiments down deep. Um, but there is technology available to, to be um, gauging what is happening beneath the surface. And so Kush Jagru has got a poster downstairs with um, observations from um, an ocean glider. And so this is, we'll, we'll do that again, we've got time. Um, this is technology that will spend a similar period of time, maybe um, three weeks through to a month, um, profiling through that region. And, and Kush shows there's an experiment actually on at the moment where there's um, two of these units out working through the sort of uh, western central Cook Strait. And so the, the cost of those operations, it's like having a Wellington house out floating out there. Um, but it's uh, telemetering back data in real time from through the water column. And so it's actually a step change in how we observe the ocean. Um, another point that I think is important to make is that um, our footprint is changing. And so if we're looking at different um, climate scenarios um, from the near future and then the, the later this century, we are looking at surface temperatures rising by several degrees. And so the heat wave that we experienced last summer may become our norm. And I think we should reflect on that quite hard. Um, we also are developing tools to actually forecast at the short times. So you know, uh, there's, I was, I was going to say it's easy to predict weather. It's not easy. A lot of effort has gone into being able to predict weather. Um, similarly, we can predict climate. It's the scales in between predicting a few months to a year that's very challenging. And so that's sort of seasonal forecasting. And so there's a poster downstairs where we look at um, predictions using modeling from the Australian Bureau of Meteorology to look out at what sea surface temperatures might be in the next coming months. Um, the, the short answer is at the moment is that they, it does okay. Um, anywhere that there's a color here represents um, an okay skill, um, but where they do the least okay is, is in summer, and that's because um, heating will heat the surface of the ocean, and so the actual sea surface temperature is very dependent on the, the short time fluctuations in wind mixing. And so the time where we're most interested in is also the hardest to do this, but you know, that's research. Um, and where to next? And so Helen McDonald um, has a poster downstairs, and, and the focus of what I've talked about so far has been the physics and transporting um, uh, physical volumes of water. Um, the next step is to actually integrate that with um, biogeochemical um, knowledge. And we're actually, in the last sort of five years, the technology has come on board to be able to sample that stuff at the same sorts of rates and resolution as the physics. And so um, we're dramatically improving how um, computer models will represent this stuff. And so a um, shout out to the team that um, combined to bring all this together. And just a, a nice figure from Tiara in that um, footprints can hang around for quite some time, so it's good to know what they're doing. Thank you. <laughs>